a conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and today I am joined by Becky Rice, and we are talking all about the Batman. Becky, I think this is the first time I have done an episode with someone and I have seen the movie that we are talking about with said person. I was going to mention that, that I was pretty sure that that was the case, but you're right, we did. We saw the Batman together, also with friend of the podcast, Janice. We did. It was a fun time. It was fun. They didn't have those Batman head things. I already, the popcorn, the vessel, they were out of the vessel. It was very unfortunate. They weren't out of them. They said that they had not gotten them yet, which I thought was insane because we were there like the movie opened on like Thursday evening. We were there on Saturday night. They definitely should have had them already. If anybody here gets their hands on a popcorn vessel, like at me and I'll give you my address. Um, <laughs> probably the address to a PO box. I'm not giving out my address to, to people on the internet. <clears throat> yeah, let's not do that. You're more than welcome to send me one if anyone feels so inclined. Thank you. So Becky, so Deanna, what did you think of Robert Pattinson as Bruce Wayne mm. slash the Batman? Bruce Wayne? <laughs> okay, 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 cool. Sick. Okay, so sick Batman. Um, we don't get a ton of um content of him as Bruce Wayne. Really, I like that he's really moody and irritable in the morning. So he's just like, I don't have, I don't have the patience for this shit. I relate to that in, in a lot of ways. We do find out this is pretty early in him being Batman. Um, it's year two, he, right? This is, yeah, Batman year two, the the, fam the famous comic story, uh, Batman year two. And so he's kind of like still adjusting to a lot of things. We don't see a lot of him as Bruce Wayne, which I kind of actually like. I'm here to see the Batman. I don't I don't need to see him like, you know, philandering and, and being, you know, Gotham's biggest playboy or whatever. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. Um, it's very believable, right? Like, I don't think that someone this angry and this, like, obsessed and, like, bent on vengeance would be able to just, like, flip that so easily when they're going to, like, a cocktail party or something. And I think the closest thing in my brain when I was thinking about it is thinking about, like, Christian Bale, right? And, like, we're supposed to believe that he's this, like, very angry Batman. His Bruce Wayne doesn't ever seem, like, upset at all about anything um and so i think that this is probably a, a much better portrayal of that even though it's way different what did you think i like that they leaned into the detective aspect a lot more in this one too because i think they did that helped with the lack of the bruce wayne side of the story because it was giving you more to the batman side that we don't normally get i forgot to say one thing about robert pattinson and that is that he is very handsome and that he is 6'1". Six 6'1 one. Six one is the perfect height for a man, and all men should be 6'1". And that's my thoughts on Bruce Wayne. Are we talking about Paul Dano now? Yeah. So he is basically the main villain as the Riddler. But we also have mm -hmm. a very unrecognizable Colin Farrell as the Penguin. And I was just like, are we sure that's him after the movie was over? He was very unrecognizable. Um, and Colin Farrell, incredible actor. Um, 5'10", little short, just saying. Paul Dano, 5'11", also a good height. 5'11 is a good height. No, I think both of them were incredible. Um, these are two villains that I like a whole lot, especially the Riddler. I, we will talk about this uh, later, I'm sure. Maybe even when we talk about casting, um, maybe even next. But um, I am so over the Joker. As a person who's been like reading Batman comics for years and years and years, and who's been watching Batman films over and over, and then also somebody who like, I mean, I feel like anybody who's seen like Heath Ledger's Joker, we we don't need to see anybody else do the Joker again, at least not right now. Like, I just I don't need it, and so it was really nice to see like Riddler not being like a side like villain or. You know, whatever, like, he's the primary villain in this. And even though Penguin is also in this, like, it's kind of to drive other pieces of plot forward. And he just happens to be the Penguin. He's not like a pride. He's not sharing the villainy with Riddler here. In fact, he's very much like referred to as like a, like a, a, a small side guy. Because we have other 
there's there's a lot of bad guys uh, in this movie. There's a lot of bad bad dudes, bad dudes in Gotham. Yeah, and a bunch of them don't even come in the form of like big Batman villains that we know. Sometimes it's just like it's the DA, and I think that's kind of fun because obviously then we have Falcone, and he plays a pretty big role in the second half of the movie, really. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, I really love Zoe Kravitz and Jeffrey Wright in this movie. I think they were so well casted. I think both of them are great. I think both of them are great. Zoe Kravitz is Catwoman. I want to know how tall those heels had to be. So she wasn't out of frame. <laughs> yeah, because she's short. She's 5'2". Yeah. And the Batman is 6'1". And he has boots on, too, mm -hmm. so he's even taller. Yeah, he's like a foot taller than her, at least, like, while they're filming. Movie magic. Movie magic, baby. I think she's great in this. I think some of it's the writing and some of it is, like, the way that she's acting. Like, Catwoman is just, like, very, like, sexual, like, creature, right? And, like, in and, and some depictions of Catwoman, it is very, like, comically overdone, right? Like, she, she can also do, like, an incredibly, like, unhinged character depending on the depiction like when we think about like batman returns like michelle pfeiffer is a like wildly unhinged catwoman um and some of that is because like those movies exist in a very like fantastical universe of batman whereas these are a little bit i wouldn't even say a little bit these are a lot more grounded in reality um and so everything is just a little bit like softer a little bit subtler i thought she was great yeah, I agree. And then you have the fact that this is also playing on the cult mentality with the Riddler. And even though he only has 500 followers, I know they're wild. No, we don't know that he has 500. Do they say followers? I feel like they say views. It's 500 views on a video that was locked and password protected. So he has like 500 Patreon subscribers. He could have lots more followers. We don't know. That's fair. There was a 500 somewhere in there. <laughs> no, but that's what they said. It, but it's they're talking about that, that final video at the end. I don't know. To me, it kind of felt like a small number, but at the same time, it also didn't. Because, like, one, we're not talking about something that's, like, a national thing. We're talking about, like, within the city of Local. Gotham. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hyper, like, localized. Like, this is an issue that only affects Gotham City citizens. So, like, 500 actually kind of sounds like a lot to me for it being like one one city i don't know um and then also again like it doesn't mean necessarily mean that that's like all of his followers it just means that those are people who saw that like video that i don't know it was like behind a, a maybe a, a paywall or something i don't know but i do know that it was password protected um and it it wasn't like out in the in the public exactly um we will talk a lot about that later when we when we're talking about like things we liked and didn't like. Um, Cause I have some myths to pick. Becky, I think we have one more person to talk about. We do. Who is that? Okay, so we have got to talk about my guy Barry Keoghan. Okay, Barry Keoghan, five foot seven, still perfect. Love him. Love a short king. I five seven is not that. It's short. I don't know. Um, it's normal height, I think, technically. I don't know. Becky only knows tall men. I truly know so many of them. <laughs> um, all of the men I know are like 5'11 and taller or like 5'5". Five five. Or Mitchell. Hi, Mitchell. He's like my height, yeah. And so the fact that there is like, I like, I don't, I don't know. I just, I don't know. They're either short or they're correct. I don't know. <laughs> I am so fucking sick of the Joker. I think I said this already. You did. I didn't need it. I did not need this. I actually do like the way that it was done. Where he's like, you don't really see him the whole way. He like kind of cracks a joke. He's like sharing a cell wall with Riddler. I love the use of Barry there. I want to see him in more things. Specifically, I want to see him in Dune. I'm sidetracked because I'm like, mm, Dune. But I just, it felt really shoehorned in there. Yeah. At the end, which is my biggest problem with the third act of this movie is it feels like a lot of stuff that you just like did not really need um just kind of like slammed in there at the end which bums me out because like i i don't want to see the joker i kind of think it would be interesting to see him as the joker but i don't want it like that if that makes sense and so my understanding is that 
Matt Reeves has no intention of setting up like a Joker uh-huh. like movie that he's like, we've done that. We've been there. Like we don't need this anymore. Or at least not for a while. And I think maybe this is just like, it's so weird to see any depiction of Batman where like Joker does not exist or has never existed. Cause like even think about like the Batman movies that we've seen that did not have Joker as a villain, either Joker eventually became a villain in those movies or Joker had already been a villain in one of the, in, in those movies. Yeah. Um, and so I'm hoping that this is just like, Hey, we're just going to give you like a little bit of a Joker because he still exists. It would make sense. He still exists. He's still in that universe. He was in and out of Arkham many, many times. If this is like year two of Batman's existence, it makes sense that like Joker would like be locked up in Arkham. I wonder if he's technically not even the um, Joker yet. And he's still like Jack Napier possibly because like he's not credited as anything like he's just credited as like unnamed arkham i almost said unnamed arkham asylum unnamed arkham inmate say that 10 times <laughs> maybe i i think ultimately it doesn't matter that we don't need to dig into it but i do know that like at that part of the movie i turned to you and janice and i said i'm so sick of the joker you did i said some other things too but we'll talk about that later and i didn't hear them so i'm excited to figure out what they were because i could not hear anything you said to Janice in the theater. Oh, fascinating. The only thing I heard was when our good friend Janice said that Catwoman's engine was purring. She did say that. <laughs> she did. That's the only thing. That's the only comment. Okay, that's funny. The Batmobile in this movie? Pretty cool. Kind of scary. Kind of based on Christine. Yeah. Big, big scary. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you, Diana? No, don't know anything about Christine. Yeah, Janice and I kind of like leaned into each other and I was like, this one's a good one. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We like the Batmobile. I like that it's different because a lot of the ones we've seen, at least prior to Batman versus Superman anyway, had like these sleek designs mm-hmm. for the most part. Yeah. This one's like a big, scary muscle car. Yeah. And I really like that because I really like cars from the 60s. So that was fun. The way we're kind of introduced to it, too, they linger on it just long enough where you're like, yes, okay, here we go. And then you get a wonderful car chase. The car chase scene is so good. And so much of it is like filmed like so practically. Oh, my God. Like, yeah, I was watching it. And I was like, I think this is one of the best car chases I've seen, especially in a really long time. Like, I didn't, it felt, it felt real. Um, speaking of feeling real, you feel close to it. And this is actually something I really enjoyed about the movie. I think more so than any other Batman movie that we've ever gotten. I think this is the most like filmmakery or like film lovery Batman movie that we've ever seen. And I, I really felt that way about the Nolan Batmans until I watched this one. And I was like, oh, the way that this is filmed, like just makes those like not even, I mean, they're still very good. And and in, in a lot of ways, I think that they're better than this movie. But from like a cinematography and like a like just like a film standpoint, this is much more the like Batman the film. God, that car chase, it's so good. It's so good. And then like at the end when you're like kinda like flipped upside down, because the car's flipped upside down and you're seeing like the flames and he just like steps out. It's so good. It's so good. I think about that like little like like couple seconds um of the movie. Like I, I think about it frequently. I do. I do. I also yeah. think a lot about the scene, the scene where he's like walking through the water with like the flare mm-hmm. lit up. The overhead shot. He's like, oh, so good. That's going to live in my brain for like the rest of my life. This movie was way better shot than I expected. I think just because of recent DC things, it felt like it was just completely different. And I think DC is at a point where they need that mm-hmm. because they have lingered so long on trying to make this one specific kind of vision work for their movies it's not good and i know a lot of people love the movies a lot have you been on the internet becky no (laughs) Zack snyder has a lot of fans i will say that i'm not personally one of them nor am i so i think just kind of letting creators do their own thing is probably going to work better for dc instead of trying to mimic what marvel is doing and have like this Mm -hmm. one big giant thing going on at all times which doesn't always work for marvel either this movie makes the marvel movies look like a big honking like 
plastic piece of crap. Like, I just, it is so visually interesting all of the time. All of the time. And you feel super close. Like, the way that everything is filmed, you feel close into everything. With most superhero films, you don't. Like, you have this detachment. Like, you're viewing it from the outside. Whereas this, like, it really feels like it, like an inside view. Um, and it's not something I have seen in, in, a, in a superhero movie like this. Um, and I love that. More, more than, like, the, like, oh, it's gritty. You're like, oh, it's grounded in reality. I think the number one reason that I like it and I loved it was just the way that it shot. The story could have sucked and I still would have walked out being like, wow, that rule. Yeah, and I think for me, it's not that I don't like the Marvel movies. I like them. I love the Marvel movies, but I don't think they look like anything groundbreaking for the most part. Nope. They're just, they're superhero movies and you're supposed to have fun with them. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. I'm hoping that this changes that though. I'm hoping that like, you know, we start seeing like superhero films that are doing much more interesting things with like camera work. I think sometimes we forget when it's a superhero movie that like film is a visual like storytelling medium. And like part of the interesting thing about film is doing interesting things with the camera as part of being a a director, like a cinematographer. If I wanted to just see the things happening, like I would read a comic book, right? I think this is far more interesting. I agree. And I think the first two thirds of this movie was really, really good. It's so good. I love the detective story. I loved everything they did with Batman and Catwoman and how they introduced her. I loved all of the interaction between Gordon and Batman. Yeah. I thought it was so good. It was so believable. That scene when they're like, kind of like whispering at each other, you know, and uh-huh. everybody's like watching them. They can't really hear what they're saying. And he's like, well, you're going to hit me. And, yeah. you know, and he's like trying to figure out how he's going to, he's like, he's like, here's the keys. It's just, it's so well done. It's so good. Their their dynamic, I think, in this movie is the best and most interesting dynamic I've seen between those two characters in any of the Batman movies. Yeah, and I'm realizing we did not mention Andy Serkis as Alfred, Ooh. but I feel like I already don't remember much about Alfred, which kind of bums me out. Well, Batman's a dick to him. Like, so... <laughs> I, I don't mind anything about their relationship the entire time, right? Like, they don't have quite the closeness and, like, affection that you're used to seeing between, like, Bruce and Alfred. However, I think it's fine because this doesn't seem like a very affectionate Bruce Wayne. And, and so that's fine. What grinds my gears is that Alfred almost died and he got his ass fucking blown up because he opened a package that exploded because it was addressed to Batman. Or, no, it wasn't. It was just the Bruce Wayne. But then I think he opened it and it said, for the Batman, and then he chucked it. Yes. Because he was like, oh no, what have I done? That's all I remember about Alfred's storyline. He got super blown up. And then when he's in the hospital, and Bruce finally comes to visit him, instead of being like, are you okay? Or... I love you, person who's taking care of me my whole life. Please don't die. Oh, yeah. He's like, did my father do this? You didn't tell me the truth about how about my dad. I'm like, shut up. The, the ending was a little rough, especially because it felt like this movie kind of did a thing that Stephen King does, where he gives you a little extra at the end that you absolutely did not ask for. This movie ended like 10 times, and so much of it was unnecessary. And I think the biggest thing that was unnecessary to me, I don't understand. So Riddler's whole thing is like hyper focused or seemingly hyper focused on the on like renewal, right? And how it's a sham, how yeah. it's not actually doing what it was designed to do or what we were told it was designed to do, and that it's not helpful or useful. Gotham City elects its very first mayor who agrees with this statement and he radicalizes people on the internet to carry out an assassination on her that doesn't make any sense to me like you got a candidate that agrees with what you're saying how and why are you so radicalized that that's the person that you're attempting to assassinate like i don't it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me and i don't love it and then especially because the assassination the way that it's done is like through like this thing of like a mass shooting and let me tell you, 
watching a mass shooting in a Batman movie while I am sitting in a Batman movie in the theater on opening weekend was horrifying for like my brain and my body. I don't know if that occurred to you, Deanna, but like when I think about mass shootings, I think about theaters and I think about Batman, right? And then here I am stuck in a movie theater watching Batman and watching a mass shoot. And I was like, I was like, this is how I die. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that. I mean, it's a little funny, but like it's because the the look on my face, I think was that I just, it was, was kind of funny, but like, I, I get it. Cause like I'm in Colorado and that's the thing that happened here. Yeah. We were not here watching the movie. I think it would have been worse if we had been here watching the movie, but it's one of those things that sticks with you. Like that happened during a Batman movie. Like it was very specific. It wasn't just like a random movie that this guy picked. Mm -hmm. But no, I did not think about that at the time because my brain wasn't working. I, it was on vacation. <laughs> yeah, I I just like as soon as I realized that like that's what was that's what we were about to watch and that's what we were watching and I was just like and and I had this like tightness in my chest and I kept I kept like getting distracted from the movie almost because I was like looking at like the exits. Yeah stress me out man i also just think that it was unnecessary like i think i understand the attempt to like portray like the usage of the internet and like the radicalization of like people who view themselves to be disenfranchised rightfully so or not rightfully so um i, I understand what it's doing there right like it's doing it's like reddit q anon yeah thing i don't know that that was how that needed to be done especially in a movie that had already started to like overstay it's, it's welcome. Yeah, one of my concerns with this movie too is that it's so long. I don't know how it's going to hold up when people rewatch it. I know a lot of people have already seen it multiple times in the theater and I love that for them. I'm not one of those people. The fact that this was a 3-hour movie and the last what 20 to 30 minutes seemed to drag the way they did because it just kept ending over and over again. I think they should have just ended it with that overhead shot of him walking the people through the water. I turned to Janice during the movie and I, I think I mentioned this in the car and Janice was like, oh, I would have hated that because it would have like guaranteed that there was a sequel. But like when he sticks his head out, he, like, he, like Batman sticks his head out the window, he's like looking for like the Riddler, and he looks kind of like directly at the camera, like right into your eyes. I wish it had just ended there. Okay. And that the next movie opened with that scene in the diner, and them arresting him, and then it carried, and like then maybe like, like this is how we wrap up like Riddler, and like we're moving into something new now. That's fair. And I know that that is probably going to be a very unpopular opinion because people don't like when movies end on like a cliffhanger type thing like that. I I don't I like when things are fun. I don't necessarily need resolution in every single thing that I do. Um, but yeah, three hours is a lot of movie, and I really wanted to walk into this and like walk out being like it was three hours, but like it had me the whole time. Like Dune, I will not lie, Dune super long movie did not lose my attention for a single second I like that last 30 minutes of this batman movie maybe it was just maybe not even 30 maybe like the last like 20 minutes of this movie it just felt like a century i was just like i can't do this well we don't need to discuss my opinions on dune because they are not remotely the same as yours it, deanna it's okay to not like things that are good it's okay to be wrong sometimes I'm aware that it was good. It's just not the movie for me. That's fine. We're here to talk about the Batman. We are. For you, is this your favorite DC movie in recent years? Like, since the Dark Knight movies? Well, God, what have we had? Justice League. <clears throat> Wonder Woman. Two Wonder Woman movies. Shazam. Aquaman. I didn't even see the second Wonder Woman movie because I did not like the first one. Okay. I think I told you this. I'm like, yeah. I think Wonder Woman fucking rocked until they leave the island. And then it just went downhill from there. And the first time I said that to somebody, they were like, that was like the first like, like 10, 15 minutes of the movie. And I'm like, yeah, it ruled. And then it got bad. Didn't like it. Wanted to. Wanted to. Love Wonder Woman. What else have we had? Man um, of Steel. Suicide Squad. 
the suicide. Oh, Man of Steel sucks, mostly because it's a Superman movie. I hate Superman. Superman is a comic book hero for children, and I am not a child. I am an adult. I have very strong opinions about comic books, which is insane because I've never read a comic book in my life, but I have very strong opinions about them. Um, speaking of comics that I've never read before, okay, so um, in the in, in Batman, uh huh, in the Batman, my bad. Um, when the thing like comes up on the screen and says like hush money, but like hush is like really big, and then like there's even like the like Elliot reference. Uh huh. It's a different Elliot. It's a, diff- it's it a is. different. It's a different person. Yeah. Um, they have different names. I remember that. Um. But I like wagged my little tail like in my seat. I got so excited. I love Batman Hush. I know that there's an animated one that I haven't actually seen it. Clearly, nor have I read it. Just kidding. I, I have. I've read it many times. I, you were reading Hush when you were here at my house, weren't you? I did read the whole thing sitting on your couch. Yeah. So when we went to see Batman, you had just finished Hush. Yeah. And I had seen the animated movie, which I didn't love. I think the comic's a lot better. I think that there's something about the animated ones, which we won't delve too deep into this. It's not what we're here for. But I love the Batman animated movies. I really do. I like them better when they're like loosely inspired by stories. I don't love them when they're direct adaptations of stories. Because I don't know if you've watched The Long Halloween. Not yet. I've only seen the first part of it. But there's something about like the excitingness and like the, the, the magic and like what it is it's compelling about The Long Halloween that the animated film just seems to like not quite capture, which is wild because it's a very true to story like depiction. There's just something about it that like doesn't quite click as well um, in that. And I think of the, I mean, I haven't seen Hush, but I would assume that it's the same thing, right? Where it's like, there's something about, there's something captivating in the story that just like somehow gets missed. I hope that with the animated ones that they stick to like loosely inspired stories, like Son of Batman, right? Yeah. With Hush, I think the issue was that they decided to change a couple things like they did with The Killing Joke, which did not go over well. No. And I think that's why the Hush movie just wasn't quite as good as the actual comic. I just feel like if you're going to make something and say that it's like, this is Batman Hush, or like, this is Batman The Killing Joke, then it should be that comic. And if you're wanting to take like, liberties with the story then you should be making a unique story like it can be similar but don't tell me that it's that it's the same beef that i had with marvel when they decided to call the like that one captain america movie like captain america civil war it made me angry that they called it that because i was like this is not what that is the only thing it has in common with that is that like tony and steve are mad at each other that's literally it yeah and There's just so many names and so many things that you can call something. Becky, to bring it back to the Batman, I think this is something a lot of people have been bringing up. Were the riddles too easy? The riddles were so easy. I I hate, I kind of hate that you were on the other side of Janice because you missed this, but I answered every single one of them correctly with like, as soon as they finished asking the question. Yeah. They were too easy. I think Janice got one of them wrong. And I was like, Janice. Oh, yeah, it's the at the end, the one with the Joker. And she's like, a laugh. And he's like, a friend. <laughs> he's like, eh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Janice has some questions. Yeah, I think that the riddles were too easy. And the thing is, is like, I don't need them to be like, incredibly like, perplexing, like for the audience. However, when they're that easy, it makes it really hard to watch the film and like Batman, an untrained detective is figuring these out after thinking about them for like a little while. But no one else, no other cop, no other detective like can can figure these out. And yet like I can, I mean, I don't know, I'm pretty sharp, but like I'm not the world's greatest detective. And so I wish that they had been a little bit more complex. However, Thinking about things that we liked about this movie, um, and even like kind of like feeding into predictions about them. Um, is it the first card? I should have refreshed my memory about this. But one of the cards has an owl on it. Uh huh. One of the cards has an owl on it, and this movie spends a lot of time 
talking about the role of wealthy white elites in Gotham City. Yeah. And the level of control and power that these people have. And I just feel like that means that when we tap into Batman's like this incredibly lengthy and impressive like rogues gallery, that what we're gonna see in the next film hopefully is the Court of Owls. Yeah. There's a lot they can do with non Joker villains. And obviously they've already used up the Riddler and the Penguin. Well and I, I think these these films these films are so hyper grounded. Yeah. Hyper grounded? It's like a we like I know what you mean. I thought that the Nolan Batmans were grounded in reality. I really did. There's fantastical elements to them for sure, but these are just like just so based in reality that I think like we're not gonna get like a killer croc or much to my chagrin, we're not gonna get a calendar man. Um what if we get the condiment king? It's possible. One, I think there's been a lot of like emphasis as of late, more so on the Marvel side than DC. Um, but of like bringing in like these like lesser talked about characters that people don't know as much about, or maybe are less in, the general public is less invested in um, and has less to critique about, and giving them a chance to kind of like showcase. But then also. The Court of Owls, I think, one, makes absolute sense. One, in today's day and age, like, if you're talking about, like, hey, like, the, the perfect villain to do in this movie is to do, like, an internet radicalized, like, Riddler, like, very leaning into, like, QAnon, then, like, I think that the perfect next step is to say, like, hey, like, let's talk about the Court of Owls, and let's talk about how, like, like wealthy, privileged people produce more wealthy privileged people who go on to like control things behind the scenes. Like that's the villain movie of a well grounded in reality Batman. Um, and I think that one, it makes sense. And I think two, like it's, it's the thing that I would maybe most want to see. Um, if it wasn't that the only like villain, I think that I could like big time hope for my ultimate 100 top of the top cream of the crop Batman villain is Scarecrow. Um, and I know that we did get some of that in the Nolan Batmans, but I feel like it wasn't enough for me. But even then, I just, I don't know that we need to revisit that now. I think Word of Owls makes the most sense. Yeah. I think at some point, I kind of want the Mad Hatter. Ooh. Okay. No, I think that that's doable in like a reality-based way. But that would also require maybe, like, bringing Wayne Industries into it more, which with the way they left off with Batman and him wanting to do more for the city, it's possible Mm -hmm. we could see like more of Wayne Industries and the charity stuff. And I don't know what their plans are for Batman. I don't know if this is going to be a whole bunch of stuff because there's a lot of stuff I want that doesn't necessarily need to have Batman in it, but could still be about Batman villains. Like, I would love a Harley and Poison Ivy movie. Do Gotham City Sirens. I feel like when they made, and I haven't seen it, when they made the Birds of Prey movie, which as far as I can tell by looking at the the content from it, is not a Birds of Prey movie at all. The, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of over Harley Quinn in the same way that I'm over the Joker. I just... That's fair. I need some time off. Um... <laughs> I think I think Two Face is a villain that would make a lot of sense, but again, I don't know that we need to revisit that. I think that we got a really great argument out of the um, out of the Nolan Batman's. However, like you watch this, and it's very obvious, you know, that Reeves is super influenced by Batman Year One um, as well as the Long Halloween. Yeah, and I think that Harvey Dent is really easy to to make into a reality based villain. Um, I think Hugo Strange could be really interesting and would also make a ton of sense in this. I also think that like Hugo Strange's ability to kind of like figure out who Batman is would be something really interesting to see because we have this like moment of where like you're convinced that Riddler knows that Batman is Bruce Wayne, and then only to find out that like 
nope, that's not the thing that he's holding on to. The thing he's holding on to and not letting us know is that like he's completely delusional and he thinks that him and Batman are working together. Yeah. The reveal of that was done so well. My guesses then are number one guess court of owls number two guess hugo strange if we get hugo strange it's not going to be alone it's going to be in combination with like some other batman villain um i think scarecrow would make a lot of sense but i don't know that we're going to see it i don't know we've got some weird stuff to work with like Clayface. i don't think that's it yeah and i don't know if dc cares about this for the movies but they used a lot of villains in the Gotham TV show. And they're using a lot of the Batman villains in Batwoman right now, too. I'm not watching Batwoman. I watch the first season of Gotham. I don't know if they're going to avoid a lot of villains because of that. Granted, they use a lot of, like, the B-list villains, like Professor Pig, the Executioner, uh-huh. and... But Hugo Strange was a pretty big part of Gotham. Was he? Yes. I only watched I only watched the first season. Is that still so on? That's not so on, is it? No. They used Victor Zaz a lot too. Oh, okay. Who is like a a very good like villain for grounded versions of the story. I just feel like if they can keep putting the Joker out there at like a thousand iterations, we can have a second depiction of like Hugo Strange. Like I just I don't That is fair. And I mean like we're talking about like a very like like this isn't like some new villain like from the last like couple of years i mean like this is like a classic member of the batman's like rose gallery i think that's fine so yeah those are my three predictions in order yeah there's so much they can do batman has so many villains that they just never use to outside of the Mm -hmm. comics which some of them i understand why and that's fine (laughs) some of them are hard to do in a film yeah, and like Ragdoll, mm. they used on The Flash, mm-hmm. which I thought was interesting. But anyway, we could talk about Batman villains all day. We don't need to do that. But is there anything else you want to bring up about the story? I feel like because we saw this in theaters and then waited like four days to talk about it, my brain is <laughs> like, wait, I can't go back and reference anything. <laughs> Yeah, it's not necessarily fresh on our brains anymore. It's very true to the comics in a lot of ways. I think it's very much like a love letter to the comics. Um, I think the references to Year One, Hush, um, Long Halloween are all like really great. And some of them, there's like small, soft, subtle ones. And then some of them, they're very like forward. And I like that balance. I think the casting was incredible. I don't think that there's anybody that I would recast. cast. Um, honestly, the only thing is like, I just wish that, that the back half of the movie, it was not even the back half, like the last like third of the movie had been like tightened up a little bit, um, maybe gotten rid of some of that. Um, I think the problem with Batman movies is that they are always trying to balance two or more villains. Yeah, it's so like in this, we're trying to figure out what Penguin is doing, or figure out these stuff, this stuff about Hong Kong. We're like figuring out about the Riddler, who's like the main villain. Like, so you have these like side things going on all the time, which, to be fair, is how life works. But it it runs into like the Spider Man three problem, where it's like, hey, like you gotta you gotta rein it in, right? I liked it though. I mean, I I know I complain a lot about like the last act of the movie, but even then, I still gave it like I think I still gave it like four stars. Yeah, so did I. I will add that I really like the set pieces. Mm-hmm. Like if you just look at all the different locations that we see, whether it's the crime scenes or Wayne Manor, the Iceberg Lounge. Oh mm-hmm. nope, I'm gonna pick a nit with that. So I don't love. Ice very loud. I don't love forty below. They, where's the ice? Where's the like? I mean, I understand it's like a more like rea- reality grounded like thing. So like it's not going to be like on ice like it like normally like is depicted. Like make it look cold. Make it look like white and gray. And like instead, it just looks like any other like fucking bar or club in like a city. Like I didn't love that. 
I think a lot of previous depictions of the lounge have been like uber fancy. And I, I even liked that it was like a little like grimier. Yeah. But I would have loved to have seen something visually that like leaned into the like, these things are named after things that are cold. Yeah. Like where was the penguin statue of ice? That's a fair point. Like it doesn't have to be like a fancy, like ritzy club, like so many of the depictions that we've seen are. But like give it some type of something that makes it like, oh, okay, that's why it's called that. Like otherwise it just feels weird. That's fair. But we weren't really spending a lot of time in the actual like club part of it. It was just like very specific back rooms. I know, but we walked we walked through it a few times. Um, and yeah. then even in those back rooms, you had like these open windows, like overlooking like the main like floors and things like that. And I just, I don't know. I, I, I wish that that had been handled a little bit differently. Again, I didn't clock that and then go, this movie's trash. It doesn't change the story at all. No, not at all. But I do wish that that had been done a little bit differently. Um, however, I love that this one is the most just like, yeah, it's New York. <laughs> like... <laughs> We're not trying to tell you that it's it's Chicago, but if Chicago was in New Jersey, like this one is like, no, like this is New York. Like this is this is Madison Square Garden. This is Times Square. Like we're just not we no. Like this is a place and it is New York and we're just calling it Gotham. And I kind of thought that, that was fun. Well, I don't think I have anything else. Do you have anything else before we do recommendations? Um, the only thing that I have is that when I came on the podcast last. I knew you asked me when Captain America's birthday was, and I told you something, and I immediately was like, no, that's not right. And so I would like to let everybody know that Batman's birthday is April 17th, 1915. Um, and then I know that because I know Batman Day. But is this Batman's birthday in 1915? Probably not, but that is canonically <laughs> Batman's birthday. The first issue of Batman came out on March something, 1939. It sure did. I don't know what the actual date is, but I know that it's March 39, and I think that's good enough. That is good enough. Thank you, Becky. I'm just trying to redeem myself for coming on the podcast previously and, like, misspeaking. I'm pretty sure I edited that out, but <laughs> now everyone knows. Deanna, so it seems like you really like this, and I know you gave it a four out of five on your letterbox. Well, let me ask you this. If I really enjoyed The Batman 2022, what would you recommend that I check out next? I really want everyone to watch Batman Returns because I feel like every time I watch that movie, it grows on me. Like, I didn't love it at first, but the more you watch it, and Becky, you know I'm not a person who rewatches things super often. I've seen that movie so many times. But I think I rewatched it for the podcast at some point. I've done too many episodes of this to actually be sure about that, but I remember rewatching it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, this is actually a really fun movie. And it's not the same kind of tone as this one by any means. Absolutely not. It is wildly different. But I think if you watch this movie, and then you go and watch that movie, you can see how wildly different interpretations of the same characters can be because of the way Catwoman and Penguin are both interpreted in that movie in comparison to this one. And I love that because the comics have different tones. Like Darwin Cook's Batman is not going to be the same as Scott Snyder's Batman. And I think the movie should do that too. And they do. And I like that. How about you? What do you have to recommend? Well, if you like this movie, then one of the things you might have liked about it is that it's very early on Batman. Like he's not, he's not a tried and true. He hasn't figured out all the like, ins and outs of being Batman. And so if that's something that you liked and you haven't read it, I would definitely recommend like reading or watching the animated like film of Batman Year One. If you just like really want like a really good story that is very heavy on like villains, um then I would say like Batman the Long Halloween, like definitely read those. Those are two like really well known and talked about like Batman comics. So I don't know, I would assume that if you listen to this podcast and you read comic books, you probably read those. But if not, check them out. Um but then just to like touch on like the 70s noir um elements of this film and to not always be making I'm, i have so many recommendations sorry um to not always be making like comic book recommendations um i would say watch the french connection um and watch taxi driver don't go out and buy it don't go out and like pay money to rent it but if you own a copy of like chinatown 
uh, and it's just sitting in your house and you've never watched it, uh, to pop that in, but like, don't pay for that. Um, I, I love that movie. I hate that. I love that. Movie. The thing about Roman Polanski is that he's a piece of shit. And also that all of his movies are good. There's a lot of Chinatown influence, uh, in this movie just in so many ways like not just like not just like the way that it's like shot but in in several of the character performances and it really pains me because i want to tell people like oh yeah like you you should watch that and like compare and contrast it um but also if you don't have free access to that movie just don't do it french connection and uh, taxi driver i think are also really good examples of like how that specific time space uh, for film is is very clearly a heavy influence on this. So you're not going to go read a comic book, but you're interested in the film side of this movie. I would definitely check those two out. So I have a bunch more homework now. Yay! I love to come on to your podcast and tell you what things. Um, Deanna, if you ever want to see Chinatown, I own it. So you can watch it at my house. You don't have to like <laughs> feel bad about giving any money in any way to, to Roman Polanski. I think I own all of his films. I hate myself. It's okay. We keep talking about Jeff Loeb comics on this podcast, too. So I would dare to say that one of those is way worse than the other one. That is fair, but they're both still not good. By a long shot. By a long shot. <laughs> well, Becky, I think on that note, we should definitely end this podcast. Yes. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, as always. And I cannot wait to come back. You'll be back. I know. The Batman!